Technology can be both a weapon and a tool. If you consider a knife, for instance, a knife is a very handy tool for peeling a green apple or cutting a lemon, but you can also use it as a weapon if you slash someone with it. You can cause damage with it. We can apply the same logic to technology. Let's say email. Email is a very handy tool for getting things done, for instance, at work, so you send emails to your coworkers. But in the wrong hands, email can turn into a weapon. Let's say a, sc a scammer or a cyber criminal sends us an email, it has a malware attached to it. So suddenly, the email becomes a weapon, it becomes a gun, and the attached malware is the bullet. Now, if you dodge the bullet, no harm done, but if you don't, it doesn't necessarily cause physical harm, but you will lose something, something of value. Today, I will talk about how technology is weaponized against us. And some of these examples that I'll tell you today are perhaps surprising, perhaps unsettling, perhaps even uncomfortable. But bear with me, it's important to talk about these things. Because things such as this can turn into a weapon in the wrong hands. This is a handy tool, this is a GPS tracker. This GPS tracker is meant to be used for your dog or for your cat, so you attach this to your dog's collar, so you can see where your dog goes, so it's a GPS tracker. It works so that um, you put a SIM card in here, and then you can see wherever this goes. A very, very handy tool. I bought it for 20 euros from my local electronics store. Now, in the wrong hands, let's say your ex slip this in the trunk of your car. Suddenly, this would turn from a handy tool to be used on your canine friend into a weapon that someone uses to track you without your knowledge. I work in cybersecurity. For most of my career, I've hacked companies. I've, I've helped them find security issues in their systems, uh, in their processes, in their uh, people who work in the companies. So I know when people think of people who are weaponizing technology, the hackers out there, people think of someone far away, you know, sitting on the other side of the world, the people you can't really see. Um, and these people, that they have financial motives, that they want to scam us, they want to steal something from us. Or that they are foreign governments who are weaponizing technology to affect our opinions, influencing us from, again, somewhere far in the distance. But the fact is that today, these hackers, these people who are weaponizing technology can be actually people that we know. It can be your friend, it can be someone from work, it can be a neighbor, it can be someone you were once in love with. And the reason, the major reason for that is that things like this is, exist. So technology that is easy to use. You don't need to be tech savvy in order to weaponize this. And there are many ways technology can be weaponized by someone we know. And I'll walk you through a couple of examples. As I said, this can be a bit unsettling, but it's important that you listen. So the first example I want to talk about is parental control apps. And now you might ask, like, why am I talking about parental control apps? To set the context, there are two types of parental control apps. The first type, the first category of apps, parental control apps, are these actual parental control apps that you can use to um, block specific apps from your kid's phone, or consensually share location with them, or set screen time limitations. These apps are privacy conscious, so they want to keep your kid's data safe. They want you to just have a mutual trust and, and you can uh, help your kids survive in today's internet. But that, that's the first category. Then there's the second category of parental control apps. These apps, they claim to be parental control apps, and I'll put air quotes here. They are claiming to be parental control apps. In their marketing material, they are saying, use our apps to monitor what your children are doing online, or use this on your other devices to, to take backups and so on. 
So they're claiming to be parental control apps, but they're incredibly invasive. They're incredibly powerful on the devices where they're installed on. They do not only do the things that I mentioned, this first category of parental control apps do. What they do is that they try to get access to everything that is on that device. So images, pictures, record calls, uh, track location, and all of this while trying to stay hidden. So these apps typically try to hide so that it's not visible if you open your phone, for instance, that there is an app like this tracking you. In cybersecurity industry, we call these sorts of apps stalkerware. We refer to these sorts of apps as malware, as malicious programs that you should not have on your device. And there is a good reason for that. Um, I want to share a personal story from my life. Um, several years ago, this was around 2020, I got contacted by a governmental entity and several support groups. They needed help because there are these safe houses, these shelters. These safe houses are meant for people who are escaping violent uh, physical or mental violence at home. So primarily women who can seek help and safe place to stay in these safe houses. Now, in these safe houses, there are fantastic professionals working in there, professionals who know how to deal with people who have faced such crises, such as violence at home. But suddenly they noticed that people didn't come alone to these safe houses. They came with all sorts of devices, these kinds of devices included. And suddenly these devices became untrusted, because when people came to these safe houses, people who they were escaping from started to find them, discover the locations of these safe houses. So, as I mentioned, there are fantastic professionals working in these safe houses, but they are not tech experts. And that's why me and a couple of other cybersecurity professionals help them, these safe houses, create a framework, a guideline, how to deal with people when they come to these places and they have devices in their pockets how to deal with those. And I mean, the problem here is that, again, like these apps are really easy to find and to install. If you go, go look up like ways on internet, how to spy and monitor on my wife or on my husband, you will find these apps that are claiming to be parental control apps again. They are claiming that they are perfectly okay to use, while they are definitely not. They are violating people's privacy. So I want to underline and summarize that these apps are incredibly invasive, incredibly powerful. And that's not necessarily even the, uh, how should I say, like wor worst part, but these apps have notoriously been known for uh, lacking several cybersecurity measures. There's one example in specific the Truth Spy, an app that claims to be, again, a parental control app, but we refer to, the, to it as stalkerware. It has been hacked by an external person, uh, or people rather, not only once, but several times. The latest hack happened late 2023, and over 50,000 devices Data from 50,000 devices was compromised. And let me put that into perspective, because this, the True Spy app, again, it's a stalkerware installed on someone's device or uh, stealing, essentially taking data from someone's device. This 50,000 devices compromised means that there is data now out there on the internet of people who potentially had no idea that this sort of an app existed on their phone. Their messages, their calls, their images, everything out there. And secondly, data of children whose parents probably had no idea that this app was lacking in security features, that they would get hacked several times. So you might have had someone's data compromised unwittingly because you were misled by their marketing. So stalkerware is one thing, but second, I want to talk about AI. And when I'm talking about AI today, I want to focus on deepfakes. Deepfake is 
an AI-generated piece of content. It can be image, video, or audio. It is trying to mimic someone's likeness. So, for instance, you could create a deep fake of your friend in the Bahamas when they were never in the Bahamas in the first place, or insert your face in, like, in an action movie. And it has the, it's a tool for entertainment and comedy purposes. But it's also, again, a tool, uh, sorry, a weapon that can be weaponized by someone we know. You see, this entertainment purpose of deepfakes is one thing. So creating content, uh, mimicking someone's likeness. But then the second use case is that you create explicit pornographic material using someone's likeness. A one, one woman once told me that once she had broken up with her ex-partner, her ex-partner suddenly posted pictures of her online, nude pictures of her online. The thing is that she never shared such pictures with him. So he had gone on Google and looked up ways how to make such pictures. And these apps, again, easy to find and one click away from destroying someone's life. Because once this sort of data is online. And to be honest, honest, nude pictures, it doesn't need to be AI generated. It can be just um, nude pictures you once shared with someone you trusted. Once those end up on the internet, it is a tedious process to try to get those things out of there. So you try to contact websites so that they would take this thing down. But the thing is that once something is on the internet, it is very likely that someone has already taken a copy of it, a screenshot of it. It may resurface later. So taking data out of internet is kind of like if you um, spill a drink on a pond of water and you try to scoop it back up. It is very, very difficult, if not impossible. Internet in these situations protects the perpetrators and not the victims. Throughout my career, I've had the, uh, like, un Unfortunately, I've faced many people and heard so many of these stories where, where when technology has been weaponized against people by someone they know. And without going into more individual details of, of people, uh, what I can say is that these sort of things, they, they leave the victims feeling very alone. They don't know who to turn to. They don't know who to ask for help. They're left dealing with all of this alone. And the, um, the things that technology causes, it causes harm, fear, trauma that exist in this real world. All of this sounds scary. And to be honest, in my job, I do see how technology can be leveraged for a lot of bad things. But I'm not suggesting that we go back in time and uninvent technology. Rather, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. And we've never been ready for technological innovations. Like, I mean, 20 years ago, this was sci-fi. What seemed like yesterday, AI as we know it today, was sci-fi. But we can do a lot, because technology is part of our everyday life. It's interfacing with our everyday life. So we can, for instance, help the people in the front lines, so law enforcement, people in these safe houses, to give them frameworks, guidelines, tools, so that they can do their work in this modern world where abuse so often leaks from this physical world into the digital world. Secondly, I would say that technology companies should take a hard look at the technology that they are creating, developing, and make sure that it would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to misuse. This might be a tall order, but I think this is something that technology companies should definitely consider. Lastly, we can all play a part in this. First of all, now you know all of this is happening, that technology is an active weapon used by people that can be close to us. So we can all take this matter seriously. And we can also do our research whenever we use apps, for instance, on other people's phones, that we are not actually accidentally compromising their privacy or security. The, the right time to start thinking about when to do technology better and more fair for all was yesterday. But today, we really need to start working on the fact that we need to make technology 
a tool for good and not a weapon for evil. Thank you.